BDAG. You may have heard of BDAG, which is a Greek English lexicon. Its longer name is a Greek English lexicon of the New Testament and other early Christian literature. And you can see from the length of that name why it gets shortened down to BDAG. Well, this is the best lexicon you can buy today to read, what, to learn the vocabulary or the, the look up Greek words in the New Testament or pretty much any other ancient Greek text around the Christian circles anyway. Uh, but it's kind of a little hard to use. And so I've had a number of requests over a period of time with people saying, hey, could you review, well, could you talk about BDAG and how to use it? Now, I have compared BDAG in the past with, say, the Brill lexicon of early Greek text. I think it's something like that anyway. You can find a link to that up here. Uh, but this, I'm gonna, in this video, I'm just going to focus on how to use BDAG from a, just from a point of view of somebody who is in the New Testament uh, and particularly wanting to study the New Testament and look up words and use a really good lexicon for doing that. So that's what we're going to do in this video. Before I get into that, I just want to tell you just a very brief history of the of BDAG, because what we're looking at, BDAG is actually the third edition of the Greek English uh, lexicon for the New Testament and early other, other early Christian literature. This is a long name. BDAG is the third edition of this English work. Before that, this it goes all the way back to 1522, the very first kind of lexicon, if you like, modern lexicon anyway, goes back to 1522 with the first ever printed uh, Greek New Testament or critical Greek New Testament. And this was printed in, in 1517, but it was published after Erasmus's Greek New Testament. And this was a Complutensian uh, polyglot, which is a collection of four writings that were all published together in multiple volumes. Now I mentioned this again in a previous video just recently when I was talking about the history of the Greek critical edition and how we kind of work out how to decide what is the Greek New Testament and what is not. And if you're interested in that, we'll click the link up here and you'll find a card there referring to that as well. Now, this was the first time we ever had a list and it had 75 pages of Greek and Latin words in it. That then was the beginning point, but then the, really the first major works were published in German. Uh, the, the, the best of these in the late 1800s, early 1900s was published in 1910 by Walter Bauer. Uh, that then became the foundation for the English version. So there was an English translation of that made, which became the first version of what we now refer to as BDAG. That first version was translated by two men. Uh, Bauer obviously wrote the bulk of it. And then Arndt and Gingrich, they worked together to revise it and translate it into English. And this first English edition was known as BAG, B-A-G, standing for Bauer, Arndt, and Gingrich, uh, the three editors or authors and editors of this Greek word, work. Now, Danker, Frederick William Danker, joined the team after Arndt passed away. Arndt was his teacher, and he passed away, and Danker joined Gingrich to revise this and create a second edition. This then was known as Bag D, uh, Bauer, Arndt, Gingrich, and then Danker was added on to the end of that. Bag D was the way this was referred to. And this was the second edition of the Greek-English lexicon that we're talking about today. The third edition really was a work primarily of Danker, who continued the work of Gingrich, who passed away in 1970-something or rather. Uh, Danker then continued to do all of this work, publishing the third edition, which is what we're talking about today, which is referred to as BDAG, because of the amount of work that Danka did to actually update that work so that we have the edition we have today. And the edition we have today is very, very good. So this is the third edition of the Greek-English uh, lexicon, but it's really called BDAG because Danka has done a lot of the work to update the previous works, take into account more modern discoveries and lexicography and linguistics and put all of that into this behemoth of a volume. Now, I don't even have a physical copy of BDAG, you don't need one either. Sometimes you'll find a secondhand copy available for cheap, or sometimes you'll get a special deal, maybe on Amazon or something like that. And if so, great, go buy a copy, it's well worth it. There, it is worth getting the third edition, I think, because there are some significant updates for the, from the second edition, and I think it's worthwhile. However, it is quite expensive. My, what I use is I tend to use the Logos Bible Software Edition, which is so much more portable. I can use it on any device and I can take it with me on my phone if I want to. And there's some other features, which I'm gonna talk about as I go through this as well. So there's a little bit about the history and how to get a copy. If you do want a copy of this on Logos, go to mntg.me slash bdag and you can get a copy for, from there 
Uh, it doesn't cost anything extra, uh, but if you do that, it does support this channel a little bit when you do that. Now, there is a physical edition of a shortened edition of this. There's an, a concise Greek English lexicon, and I'll leave a link in the description below, and you can get a copy of that from there on Amazon. You can get it on Kindle, and you can get it physical copy as well. That's probably the second best, but it's still two thirds the price of the full edition, and so I would still recommend considering getting the $99 Logos edition if you can afford it, okay? Anyway. Let's get into some text in BDAG, and you can see here what I've done is I've split my screen essentially between, on the left hand side I have a Tyndale House Greek New Testament, and on the right hand side here I have a number of lexicons uh, and other works that I've got here. I've actually got two copies of BDAG open, probably don't need both of those, so we'll close one. So here's the forward, and I encourage you to have a quick look through this. It gives you a bit of a history of uh, the lexicon itself and how it came together over the years, which is where I got the information I told you just a few moments ago. Uh, it also goes into some details about some of the distinctions here uh, as well that you'll find as you look at this edition compared to previous editions as well. So nonetheless, let me just start by giving you a quick tip on how to really use BDAG well with Logos Bible Software itself. You can see here I'm in the Gospel of Mark chapter 1 verse 27 and I'm going to look up this word here uh, which is thambao which is to be amazed or astonished. You can click that word and we can double click it and we can see it turn up here. Now it could be and it's very likely that for you this didn't turn up quite the way you wanted it to turn up. So let me show you how to do this. It may be that you double click that word and it didn't work with BDAG. So essentially what's going on is that Logos honors what's called your prioritization. And so you can click on the little three stars or the three dots here and choose prioritize resources. And then what you want to do is you want to bring in, let's say I want the Greek English lexicon here, which is Little and Scott. You can see I've got BDAG here. Uh, here's BDAG and here's Little and Scott. So now that I've put Little Scott, uh, the lexicon ahead of BDAG, when I double click on this word, it's going to open it in Little and Scott. So what you want to do is click on your, log, your library, click on the three dots up here, choose prioritize resources, and you want to make sure that BDAG is the first lexicon in the list. And as long as you do that, when you double click a word in your Greek New Testament, wherever it happens to be, it will open a link to that in Logos, in, in BDAG, uh, in Logos Bible Software. So we'll make that the primary option for you to look at. Hey, if you're finding this helpful, hit the like button on this video. It really helps this video get found by more people. And don't forget while you're at it to hit the subscribe button and the notify bell. Let's get back to it. Now when you're in here, you'll see that the layout is actually quite a nice layout. Let me walk you through a few things. First of all, obviously you've got the word itself, the word we're looking at in this case with its lexical form. Okay, the lexical form is uh, the present active indicative first person singular. Uh, and so you can see here, following that, we get a number of other forms that we see this in as well. So, for instance, we see with this one, we have a first aorist form, uh, basa. We have the imperfect passive form that they, they put in here as well. And then we have a first future passive form as well. So he shows you a number of the forms that you will see. I don't think this is exhaustive, but it's a good guide to just how this word will look in different uh, tense forms as you find it in the Greek New Testament. You can also see underneath that then we have a number of other uh, entries here and you can see in the blue these this means that these are links if you like. They normally indicate a footnote of sorts uh, so these are all you can see by the dot afterwards this is actually a um, an abbreviation and so if you mouse over it you'll see the whole you know you'll see the whole thing a little bit more so hom is short for homer and if you want a full list of this and this is one of the reasons why i had bdag open uh, previously over here there is actually if you click on the side here and you go to abbreviations uh, you can do a search for all of the previous writers uh, that you might happen to find so you can actually look up uh, some of these people and here you go here's hom uh, Homeric uh, hymns and so on. Um, so you can look up some of those abbreviations and uh, whatnot in that early section there as well. So you can see here editors, editions of the New Testament, there's other writings and so on uh, as you go through here. So it's very easy to find what those refer to, but you'll need to sort of find your way through some of those. And really, it's just easier just to put your mouse over these and just sort of see what it says there. Now, with this one, it's actually got a list. So what you find is that uh, we've got this five volume set of uh, Homer 
and you've got here a number of words that are cited in these lists here. And so he's just making a reference to that uh, back in that word. All right. So that's it for that piece. So you've got some other citations of this and where to go look at these. You can see it turns up in the Septuagint as well and so on. Then we have a number of these uh, Arabic numerals here, and these refer to different lexical ranges or lexical senses that are found within the different uh, literature. Now, what we find is that when you look at any given word, the meaning of a word makes sense based on its context. So it's dependent on the context. So here we have one form of this, and notice here we've got intra, I-N-T-R here. This is short for intransitive. And so we find a small number of instances of this word, in fact, we only find one really, in Acts chapter 9 verse 6, uh, where this word is used in an intransitive sense. Now, this is actually really interesting. Uh, look at what he's saying here. This is astounded in Acts 9, 6. The TR following that refers to the Textus Receptus edition. But if we click over here to look at the Byzantine version of the Textus, so this is the Textus Receptus. This is a current edition. I think this is the, this is the uh, Robinson Pierpoint uh, Septu uh, form of the Byzantine text. And you can see here that we don't actually have this word here in, the, in this particular edition. So what we're looking at here is Enoi. So in this case, we've got a variation here, uh, Enoi, Enoi to, with a double nu. Uh, so that's not really a significant variation. But there is an indication here that this word is actually not the same word in this edition as in previous editions. And if we go back to William Tyndale's 1522 English translation, which used this Erasmian text as its base, you can see here the men which journeyed with him stood amazed. So they didn't stand speechless like the Robinson Pierpoint text gives us, they stood amazed. And so this is the use of this form that we're seeing here reflected in this text. Now I don't have a Greek text of this uh, in my library, uh, unfortunately, so we just have to work with this English edition for the moment. But you can see here that what he's indicating here with these footnotes is that there is a Textus Receptus edition which holds this intransitive form of this word uh, but it's only in the Erasmian form or the Erasmian critical Greek text. Uh, and so this would be one of those ones that perhaps the Complutensian uh, polyglot did not include this particular reading. And so uh, it's eliminated for whatever reason. Okay. Anyway, so going back here, you can see we've got our word here. Now, you can see we've got a couple of different uh, glosses here. So one is to be a standard. And the, the idea here is that this word trembling is similar to this word being astounded. Trembling and astounded, in fact, is what the text of Acts 9, 6 is in this Textus Receptus edition that they're referring to here. But elsewhere in our literature, and by our literature, he's really referring to the New Testament and early Christian writings, and our literature is only ever found in a transitive sense. And that means it has its object, and then it's only in the passive uh, with the active sense of to be astounded or amazed, and more specifically, passive with a state of sense of to be astounded or amazed. So we can see here a number of occurrences of this, and you can see here, in this particular instance, we have a reference to the verse we're looking at here in Mark chapter 1, verse 27. Uh, and you can see here, just like he says, uh, it's in the passive, right? This is a passive tense form that we have here. Uh, so an aorist passive indicative, third person plural. They were amazed. They were all amazed and so on and so forth. So he carries on then uh, with a result clause that follows from that. And so uh, you can see this is a standard use of this particular word. Now, if you were flicking through here and you wanted to more quickly find this reference to Mark chapter one, well, Logos has a great way of doing that. If you click on the three dots up here, these three little round filter thingies, I don't know what you'd call this, but it's visual filters. You can actually click on this checkbox here to emphasize active references. And that will then highlight in pink the, the references that are open right now in whatever Bibles you happen to have open. So for instance, if I was to open my Robinson Pierpoint text here and move to Acts chapter 3 verse 11, you can see that it lights up this third reference here as well. So to indicate that this reference is one of those ones that actually has this word in it and we can see it here as well. All right, so very easy to then find uh, texts that actually have the, the, the reference that are referred to in the in BDAG itself. Now the benefits of this is when you get to a much longer entry. So let's take for instance Logos, right? 
And let's say, for instance, we are looking at John, John 1, just for the fun of it. And it helps if you're not typing in um, Greek in the location box. Anyway, so here in John 1, we're looking at Hologos, right? And we're looking for what sense does he think that Logos is being used here? Now we've got one here talking about just a word, talking about uh, a, a form of communication whereby the mind finds expression, chiefly oral, right? So somebody, and you've got a number of examples here, uh, and notice here just for what it's worth too, just when you lay out, you've got a number of references here. So here's Justin, uh, Justin, Justin Martyr. Uh, yeah, so second century AD, and you can actually click on the reference here to see the reference lined up over there. Uh, but you can actually look at the references and even the Greek text if you've got those as well. But here you can see he's, or a word, or a work, right? So he's referring to something spoken in this context. And so you can see the fact that that's not a bold text, like you can see, for instance, Acts 7 is here, indicates that this is not a biblical text. So biblical texts are always in bold. Non-biblical texts are always just regular weight texts. But you can look at here, you can see how he's using this word, and it lines up with what Duncan is saying here that it has been useful. But we don't see here anywhere John 1.1 1, 1 being used to refer to a particular word or a message or anything like that. You get some variations of these as you go through, still with that same basic idea. And then we go through until we find uh, some other ones. So here's a second one, computation or reckoning. So there's another use of logos that we find, and this is often found with compound forms of this root as well, in verbs as well. Um, so we see some examples here, Romans 14, for instance, give an account, make an accounting. Uh, each of your account, each of us will give of himself an accounting to God, is what he's getting at there. And you can see this word uh, being used in this sense here, but we don't see again John 1 1 being referred to. So we get a third sense here, and this is where it gets kind of interesting. So what Duncan does a lot of the time, and what the word men he's been working with here have been doing as well, is thinking through how the word is being used. And you can see here with Logos in this case, he's referring to this is an independent personified expression of God. And he's saying here, our, log, our literature, Christian literature, shows traces of a way of thinking that was widespread in contemporary syncretism. Syncretism is a word that just means uh, religions that are being merged, essentially. When a religion is merged with another religion, it's syncretism. Uh, and so also with Jewish wisdom, uh, wisdom literature, and with Philo as well. And the most prominent feature, he says here, is the concept of the Logos, the independent personified word of God. And he goes through here and talks about Justin's Apology uh, and a number of other texts that you can go through as well. And you can look at how this is being used not only in Christian literature, but also other literature as you work through the text here as well. But this is a third sense in which this word is used. And you can see that is the third. There are three senses in which the word Logos is used. And you've got all three of those are accounted for in the text that we have in BDAG. Now, again, the benefit of having this highlighting turned on is you can see very quickly which one Danke believes is the correct one for the text you're looking at. Now, it's worth noting as you're looking through this that not every instance of the word Logos is going to be in this article. That would be exhaustive. This word occurs lots and lots in the New Testament. And so you find a representative usage, perhaps with the most uh, important references in most cases. But for words like we saw before, such as thamba, thambeo, uh, this word here, uh, this word you do see often with words that don't occur very often, you'll see pretty much all the usages of this word in the New Testament will be accounted for in the text. Unlike some other dictionaries, there's no... Um, uh, there's no indicator to indicate whether he has included all of the, the text in the New Testament in this article or not. Now, just going back here to Mark chapter 1 again, uh, a new teaching with authority, according to authority. Let's, lay, let's take a look at this word kine here, which is this word for new. And you can see that just like Logos, there's a number of different lexical ways in which this word is being used. And he breaks this also into sub-items as well, which is also kind of helpful. Uh, so here's something that is new with contrast to something that's old. And there's one, one version of this where there's no criticism of the old that's implied in the use of it. And then there's another sense in which the old has become obsolete. So you can see the different usage uh, usages of these. Now, let's just say, we can see here very clearly my reference in Mark 127 appears here. 
But if I want to, another feature that we have in the Logos edition of this is to actually make this a little bit more readable by turning on Outline View. And you'll find that by clicking on the visual filters and clicking the box next to Outline Formatting here as well. And what this does is it breaks out different uses of it. So for instance, uh, you'll see here we have a new or unused reference, a new or unused monument, something like that and so on. And so you can see the different things that it's used to refer to. Another one here, uh, the connotation of something uh, unknown or strange, something introduced. So we have new commandments, new name, a new song, a new tongue and so on. And so again, very similar, obviously, it's the same word being used and it's the same fundamental idea, but you can see there's a slight distinction between the two uses of the word. And having that outline view allows you just to sort of split those out so you can see the different instances where such ideas are referred to. So we have, for instance, a new commandment uh, referred to by John in three different occurrences uh, in his reference to it with Intel A here as well. Now, the other thing that I wanted just to show you about BDAG is if you click on, uh, if we go into say an alternate text, like here's the Septuagint, for instance, uh, we can look up words in the Septuagint. So just like we've got Cardia here, we can double click on Cardia and it goes to uh, BDAG as well. BDAG is used, has words in it that refer, that come from both the Septuagint and in addition to the Septuagint, we also find that if we go into the Apostolic Fathers and we look up words in here, we can also find words here that don't occur in the Greek New Testament. But if we double click, let's say this word here, which is a putting together of autos and uh, pineo to praise. If we double click on this word, we don't find this word in the Greek New Testament, but certainly when we look it up in BDAG, we see it there very easily. And the reason for this is again, this is the Greek English lexicon of the New Testament and other early Christian literature. So it's intentionally designed to help us not just with the reading of Greek New Testament, like some lexicons are, but also with the reading of other texts related to that, such as the Septuagint and the Apostolic Fathers as well. And these become primary texts uh, for, the, for BDAG itself. And the same goes for even some of these later ones like Philo and Josephus and other ones like that as well. If we look up these words, this is automatically I've prioritized obviously my English version of Josephus, but you can easily look up the Greek text of these as well uh, by just, you know, putting it side by side or opening another text if you want to. So BDAG is a really good tool for looking up words in whatever early Greek text you're looking at, whether it's a Septuagint, whether it's the New Testament, or whether it's the Apostolic Fathers. So I recommend that you get a copy. This is my go-to lexicon. I use it for pretty much everything. I do have a number of other lexicons that I that I sort of look at occasionally, but most of the time I find what I'm looking for here in BDAG, and I often will use those other lookups of other passages, be it in the Apostolic Fathers or somewhere else, to actually see how other uses of the word are working so that I can see is that an appropriate use of the word here as well. This is actually really helpful for discovering things like metaphors and things like that because there are some words where it is merely a metaphor and you just we only have the metaphorical use in our literature and that's referred to by Dunker as well which makes it really easy to understand the actual original meaning of the word and how the metaphor is actually working. So let me know, I'd love to hear from you. Do you use BDAG or do you use another lexicon? Leave a comment in the comment section below. And let me just say here, please don't say Strong's. Uh, the Strong's starts with English and then goes to Greek. We're really looking for, if you're using a lexicon that's Greek to English, that's what I'm interested in hearing here. And what do you think of it? Tell me all about it and what you think in the comment section below. I look forward to hearing from you there. If you're interested in learning Greek so that you can make full use of BDAG and tools like that, then can I encourage you to download our starter pack to learning the to read the Greek New Testament. It's just going to give you some tools and tips and some how it actually works to help you to learn the what it's going to look like to learn Greek. Okay, so go get that at bma.to slash starter pack. Thanks so much for watching. Keep taking small, consistent steps toward mastery so that you can use BDAG to its fullest extent possible. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video. I'll see you then.